Let's get started. How can I apply to the second logic reference this uh, year? Um, yeah, I'm glad to see so many people in person. It's great. And also, I know some people online. Um, so, another local speaker today, uh, Russell Miller, needs no introduction, really. <laughs> you all know him very well. And uh, talk about interpreting the field in its Heisenberg group. Right. Okay. So, um, thank you all for coming. Um, let me just ask if somebody online can give a wave or something and confirm that this is coming through, that you hear us. Um, it is. Thank you. Okay. Sounds good. So, off we go. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about joint work with a lot of people. Um, so, I think I will just name them as we go here. But it's it's a topic that that that, that's pretty accessible. So it seems good um, for, for an early talk in the logic workshop here. Um, let's, let's get started. It's always good to start with something that people know already, one assumes. So an interpretation, the, the classical definition here of an interpretation of one structure A and another structure B. Um, these can be structures in different languages. That's perfectly okay. Um, the interpretation is, is essentially a way of seeing a copy of the structure A inside the structure B in a definable way. Um, so specifically, there's, there's some definable set D of traditionally of n tuples from B, pick any finite n you want, um, and that set D should be defined by a formula. Okay, so delta, fine formula and n free variables. And you, you think of that as the domain of the copy of A, but one further step is necessary. Um, you're allowed to put an equivalence relation on that set D, provided that it's definable, of course. And so the, the epsilon formula could simply be, say these two tuples are equal, but it's allowed to be a little more complex than that if you want. Puts an equivalence relation on them. And then the idea is that that domain, modulo the relation, under various definable relations, again, definable in B relations, should be isomorphic to A. Okay. So um, I, I, I've, here I've made the, the language of A relational just to keep things simple, but functions and constant symbols could be accommodated perfectly well, of course. Um, and I did say that the equivalence relation is a little bit irritating sometimes. If you're lucky and you can do an interpretation where no equivalence relation of that type is necessary, where, where you just say equality on tuples, then we gets a little confusing sometimes. We would define that to be a definition of A inside B. Okay, it would still use tuples, N tuples. Um, but okay, so, so those are interpretations. And again, they, they come up in any standard model theory course fairly early. Um, they're, they're often used to show that, well, you know, uh, uh, the theory of one structure is undecidable, and I can interpret that theory, I can interpret that structure in another structure, well, then the theory of the second structure must also be undecidable, because if I just decide the theory of the second structure, I could use the interpretation to decide the theory of the first structure, right? Standard sort of use of this. This notion. Okay. Um, it's well known, but somehow not as often remembered that interpretations actually are functors in a certain way. Um, you'll find this in, in the Hodges book on model theory, or at least in the big Hodges book. I don't think he thought it worthy of inclusion in the shorter book on model theory, but um, they are in the following sense. So, First of all, functors, um, we have to be talking about some categories here. So for any structure B, I'm going to write ISO of B for the category of all isomorphic copies of the structure B. Okay. Now, set theorists might object to saying all of them, so, and, and I might object to the objection, but in fact, I'm going to say, okay, let, let's, let's cut it down a little bit. Let's say the domain has to be the appropriate cardinal, the size of beta, 
for today, that will always be omega. We'll only be looking at countable structures. Okay. And so, so those are the objects in the category, all these isomorphic copies of B. And then the morphisms in the category are the isomorphisms between those objects. Okay. That, that works. That's a category. And now, if, if you have an interpretation of A in B, then again, the way we expressed it the first time around, from any copy of B, from any B tilde, you can pull out an A tilde. The one thing that you might worry about is technically on the last slide, the domain of the A uh, is a set of integrals from B tilde, okay? As opposed to that cardinal omega kappa, supposed to be, um, it's not very hard to convert one into the other, right? Just, hey, they're n tuples from kappa, code them into kappa in an appropriate way. This can be done. So, okay, so that's the first half of the function. Right from any object in ISO of B, you get an object in ISO of A. And the second half comes totally naturally. If you have an isomorphism between two copies of B, well, the copies of A that you pulled out of these things, so A tilde and A prime, respectively, um, were totally definable, right? And so this isomorphism is going to map the definable set, all right, your D, of the domain of A tilde onto the definable set, the set defined by the same definition in A prime, which is to say D prime. It will map the equivalence, I'm sorry about tilde of the equivalence relation, but okay, whatever. Um, it'll map the equivalence relation onto the equivalence relation. It will map each of the interpretations of the relations in A tilde onto the same one in A prime. And so you get an isomorphism from A tilde onto A prime. Perfectly simple, right? It makes total sense, as I say. Um, and what we're going to be doing in this in this talk often is looking not just at ISO of B and ISO of A, but we might think of a sort of a conglomeration of those categories. So, for instance, your your um, you might think of the category, let's say, of all maybe countable integral domains. Um, again, on omega, as always, if they're countable. And think of the, the interpretation, which gives you the procedure of, of producing a quotient field of a domain. It's the same formula in every case, right? I mean, the process of producing a quotient field is totally uniform. And so you could do this exact same thing with the category of all integral domains under isomorphisms, mapping into the category of all fields under isomorphisms, right? And that would work perfectly well. Okay, any questions or anything as we go along? You're always welcome to speak up here. It's a logic workshop. You know, you're allowed to, to work. Um, okay. would, it, yeah. would it be possible maybe just to minimize the thing on the side? So it's like, oh, yes. Are you doing that right now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Um, I'm supposed to be watching in case anybody else asks to be admitted, by the way, but you'll all see that too. So <laughs> if you see it, I don't stop me. Okay, so, um, so. Interpretations give functors. Not all functors, however, come from interpretations. Right? So standard example, um, the, actually I want to say thanks to Matthew Harrison Trainer here. This example is pretty obvious when you think of it, but he's the one who thought of it. Um, there's a perfectly normal functor from fields to rings, which takes any field and gives you back the polynomial ring in one variable over that field. You get clearly a functor, you know, an isomorphism from E to F gives you an isomorphism from E of X to F of X, just by map on the coefficients. Um, but there is no interpretation at all, let alone a uniform one across all fields. There is no interpretation of the polynomial ring F of X in F. Okay, that, that needs a proof, but okay, go prove it. It's not hard. Um, the problem, of course, is Polynomial, I mean, well, intuitively, you know what we want to do, but a polynomial consists of a tuple of elements of F, the coefficients, right, of arbitrary length. And the traditional definition said you have you, you can fix your n, any n you want, but then you have to go with n tuples. Okay, so um so that that 
discussion we had earlier goes one way, but not the other. But as I say, you know, intuitively, we know exactly what's going on when we, in, when we want to interpret f of x in f. It's just, we're kind of tied down by the definition. So maybe it's time to untie and draw a, a broader definition here. So the, the solution is going to be to generalize this notion of interpretation here. Um, so let's, let's jump ahead with that, moving along. Um, so this now, okay, this is still not the, the absolute most massive definition of interpretation you can come up with. What I'm giving you here is a definition of effective interpretation because I'm in computability and we tend to think about doing things in an effective computable manner. Okay, so, so read through this one with me first and then we'll talk about what's going on. Um, it's much the same definition, right? You want to define a set B, um, you, uh, you want to define an equivalence relation, I'm sorry, define a set D within the structure you're looking at, define an equivalence relation on it, and define each of the relations by formulas, again, in B. So what's different? Well, the first thing that's different is the set D is allowed to be a subset of B to the less than omega, which means the set of all finite length tuples from B. So, so not just n tuples for any fixed n. You can, they have to be finite length, but they can be as long as you want. Okay. Um, the, the, now, the equivalence relation, therefore, has to be able to accommodate you know, any pair of n tuples for any n. Okay, so it's a bit more of a formula than in the past. Um, what sort of formulas are we allowing here? Well, okay, go up to the top. Um, GC, so, so generalized computable infinitary sigma one formulas. All right. The fact that they're sigma one has to do with meeting a computability theorist and model one too. Um, the fact that they're infinitary has to do with the fact, well, we want infinite, we want arbitrarily long tuples and it's going to take infinitely many different salons to say how to deal with tuples of each of these lengths. And in fact, even just delta sort of is going to have to allow tuples of arbitrary length here. You know, again, thinking of the example of polynomial rings. So we want these broader formulas. Okay, now um, some folks here have, have dealt with computable infinitary formulas a lot, others not much, I assume. Um, as long as we stick to the sigma one infinitary formulas, I can tell you exactly what they are. A sigma one infinitary formula is simply the disjunction of a countable list of finitary, plain old sigma one. If you start going up to sigma two, sigma three, sigma four, definition gets a little more complicated. But um, another reason for sticking with sigma one here is just to keep it simple. Um, okay, so so. So you can say, for instance, you know, for, for any pair of degrees you're interested in, you can have a formula that says, here's how you multiply a polynomial of degree C, which is to say a C plus one tuple, by a polynomial of degree D. Right? It's gonna be different for all these different Cs and Ds, so you need a lot of different formulas that say this, but um, you can, it is certainly possible to list them all out. You can even give a computable list of those formulas, not a problem makes this thing here a computable infinitary sigma one formula. And um, we're generalized is in there because technically these aren't even formulas in L omega one omega, for those who know what that is. If you don't know about that, don't worry. Um, they aren't in L omega one omega because they involve infinitely many free variables, right? And so you can think of it as a disjunction of L omega omega formulas, each of which is in turn this sort of thing. Okay, question for me. So could you, could you think of this basically just as being an infinite list of sigma one formulas, one for each yeah. parity? So, so, so as long as it's sigma one, you can just say it's an infinite disjunction, let's say. Um, and it, you know, if the arity is wrong, then the disjunction doesn't apply to that. 
if a, if a particular disjunct is about a different arity, then it doesn't apply. Um, we do want to allow, however, that for, for one particular arity, you know, like one particular C and D, even there, it could be an L omega one omega form. So even there, it could be an infinite list of that infinite disjunction of, sig of finite terrorist signal. Uh, it really sounds much stronger than we want. I'm not sure if like the signal one restriction is going to deal with that or what. Um, sorry, what? Just allowing an infinite area disjunction for each arity. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, you get something that's a good deal stronger here than traditional interpretations. I mean, that's certainly true, but they are still interpretations in a very reasonable sense, you know, definable ways of seeing the structure A inside the structure B. We potentially want the weakest interpretation or notional interpretation that would get us following the rings, we get this potentially get something different or? Um, so, well, I mean, the polynomial rings are a good example, but what we'd like ideally is to be able to say interpretations that are equivalent to having a functor, okay. right? I mean, it should be pointed out, these sorts of interpretations do still give you a functor, okay. right? Everything is definable. So you know, an isomorphism has to respect everything definable. So if okay. an isomorphism from B tilde to B prime, once again, will carry over to an isomorphism from A tilde to A prime. Just one more thing, is it really, uh, Stronger than I mean, there was no um, complexity restriction in the original definition. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so if, if we want, so, so this, so if we went back to the original definition and said sigma one everywhere, right. then this yeah. would be stronger. Yeah. Um, since we didn't, I get yeah. Technically, these are incomparable. Right. Um, as I say, you can take away the sigma one restriction here. It takes more work to define the infinitary formulas in that case. You know. Sigma two means countable disjunctions of computable infinitary pi one formulas. I mean, you can sort of guess how it works, but I just don't want to go there right now. Um, maybe one other thing to point out here: there's there are two extra lines in this compared to the original definition. Um, one saying you don't just want an existential definition of the equivalence relation; you also want an existential definition of its complement. And that's, again, for effectiveness reasons. We'd like to be able to decide the equivalence relation. And if you can enumerate both the relation and its complement with you know, existential formulas, then you can decide the equivalence relation. Now, just look for a witness either saying, yes, these things are equivalent, satisfying epsilon, or no, they aren't equivalent because they found a witness that satisfies epsilon star. Okay. And the exact same thing with all the relations here. Um, you don't just want a definition of the relation itself, you also want a definition, again, existential, of the complement. Okay. So, yeah, so that's what's going on here. So it's effective in the sense that there is now a computable way to use these formulas to pull the copy of A out of the copy of B. So, um, this definition was given by Montalban about 2014. Honestly, it's it's just about exactly the same concept that had been kicking around in Russian logic for some decades before that. Antonio knows this. Um, uh, but in any case, that um, turned out when we started thinking about computable functors, 2015, 16, turned out to be equivalent to the, the effective interpretation, exactly what I had on the last board, turned out to be equivalent to the existence of a computable functor. Okay, so that, that basically said, that, that's what more or less convinced us that expanding the definition of interpretation this way felt like the right way to do it, basically. Um, so again, one of the two if and only if directions here um, is, is still clear. I mean, we said if A is effectively interpretable in B, that gives you a way of pulling copies of A out of copies of B and going from isomorphisms on B to isomorphisms on A, and that's totally functorial. That's the same argument as in Hodges way back. Um, but the Polar's definition, that takes work. I'm not going to try to describe it very much here. Um, so 
I should say at least what a computable functor is. Okay, not just any old functor, but one where you can actually figure out what it's doing, you can compute what it's doing. Um, and so part of the point is that, that a computable functor does not just look at computable structures, okay? The operation, the, the, doing the functor should be effective even on non-computable structures. So the way we do that is we say, okay, there should be a Turing functional, right? So, so a functional that accepts both an input from the natural numbers and an oracle, okay? And the oracle can be any real that you want, any subset of the naturals. In particular, it could code the atomic diagram of the structure that you have in mind. So in this case, the structure B, this is saying this functional B, if given the atomic diagram of um, tilde, apologies there, B tilde, it computes the atomic diagram of the, the other category, F of B tilde. Okay. That's half of a functor, right? The second half should also be given by another Turing functional. And this one, if you should take any morphism in the original category, so basically an isomorphism between B tilde and B prime. And if what you need to give it is not just the isomorphism, but also the two atomic diagrams. You know, it's no fair just saying, hey, here's a map. I'm not telling you anything about the structures. You know, <laughs> that, that would be too much to ask. So, so you give it the atomic diagrams of B tilde and B prime and the isomorphism between them. And from that much, it's supposed to compute the image morphism, the corresponding isomorphism between these two copies. Okay. I mean, certainly it's perfectly okay for phi star to know what phi does and to figure out phi of B tilde and phi of B prime, but then it still has to compute the isomorphism between them. Okay. Um, so, so this theorem goes by the name often of HTM cubed. Harrison Trainer and then the other three of us who were all M's. Um, a few years later, we, we went in and asked the sorts of questions that were coming up just now and said, what happens if you don't restrict the single one form twice? If, you know, if, if you don't feel the need to do this quite so effectively. And it turns out that there is a more general version of this. Um, Sasha Melnikov had finished his postdoc and gone off to New Zealand by that time. So the second theorem is HTM squared. Um, and that that applies almost to all functors, not quite. All functors that are Borel. Okay, so um, Borel in, in the sense of looking at them as maps from the copies of B to the copies of A, these things do form Polish spaces in a fairly natural way. Um, and again, that's not a place that I'm gonna go in this talk, but it, it should get mentioned briefly. Um, so, so there you simply go up in complexity on the infinitary formulas and up in complexity on the functors. And it, 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 the different levels pair up, you know, sigma two and, and or L functors where you, you just have the jump of the atomic diagram the structure, things like that. Questions? Right. Um, I can't see much of the people watching online right now. So if anybody does have a question online, it's fine to shout it out. That's probably the only way you're gonna get my attention. <laughs> so, okay. So now let's come to the second part of the title. Um, what did that take, half an hour? Yeah, just about. So um, second part of the title, um, the Heisenberg rule. Okay, so this is a well-known concept, but let me remind you, not everybody remembers. Um, so if you start with a field, the Heisenberg group of that field is the multiplicative group of upper triangular matrices, three by three matrices. Um, upper triangular means ones on the diagonal, zeros below it. So essentially an element of the Heisenberg group is just a triple of elements of F. Any three elements you want, it will certainly it'll be invertible automatically. And um, and okay, so, so I actually wrote out the matrix multiplication here. Um, first of all, to make the point that, look, yes, everything here is defined using the field operations, of course. So there is an interpretation of the Heisenberg group in the field. 
and it's even just a plain old traditional interpretation with triples, right? And you just you know say this and this and this to, to explain how to do multiplication. And so, so it's been known for a long time that you can interpret the Heisenberg group in the field, and the formulas are exactly the same no matter what field you're using. So that's all good. Um, second point, this is a non-commutative group. It's a matrix group, so this is not a surprise. But you can see exactly where the non-commutativity happens if you look at this example. I mean, a lot of things work out okay. The, the only place where sort of the prime and non-prime fail to commute is this a B prime up here. And what you deduce from that pretty quickly is that the center of this group consists of matrices where the A and the B are both zero. Okay, so anything which is all zeros except the diagonal and the C up at the top. Okay, um, so that's the Heisenberg group. Yes, interpretable, indeed definable, remember, in the field itself. Right, definable meant that it's interpretable as these triples with no equivalence relation beyond equality. Question that kicked around for a long time was, is it possible? Well, okay, so, so first of all, this was answered in 1960 to some extent. Um, the question was, how could you interpret the field F in its Heisenberg group? I mean, it's not even obvious that you can do that. Is it just offhand? You could imagine that maybe two non-isomorphic fields would both have isomorphic, would have Heisenberg groups isomorphic to each other. That happened. You think about it for a bit, you probably start to say mm, it seems difficult, but it's not obvious that it can't happen. Things. So, so you know, even just you know, is this map invertible? Is this script H invertible? Is the first question, and then if it is, is there a good way to pull F back out of H of F? Okay. And so Maltsev gave an interpretation in 1960, traditional interpretation by existential formulas, except that he said, okay, you need to, to pick two parameters in the group. Okay, so I, I guess when I gave those definitions early on, I didn't talk about parameters at all. But um, you, you can imagine that simply by saying, well, um, if you're trying to interpret A and B, sometimes you can, you maybe, maybe can't do it, but you could do it if you extended the language by maybe you know, four constants and you named four particular elements of B, that might allow you to do the interpretation. So if that happens, you would just think of those four things as parameters, essentially. And so Maltsev came up with a very nice interpretation using two parameters. Um, and so I'll tell you what it is here. Um, the parameters can be any two non-commuting elements in the group. Um, the, the traditional choice, I mean, if you're actually looking at this as a matrix group, the natural choice is to use this and um, 0, 0, 1. Um, okay, so, so I mean, so here, what the A was one, the A prime was zero, the B was zero, the B prime was one. And so if we go back just for a moment to, to uh, back, yes, sorry, um, to this, um, the A times B prime will be one, but A prime times B will be zero. So you see why things don't commute, and why those two don't commute. Okay, um, so, so you can think of those as the parameters if you want, but again, understand, we're, we're trying to do this interpretation. All you really have is the group with its multiplication, right? If somebody says, choose the matrix 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, what do you mean? It's just a group. I mean, tell me what element of the group I should choose, okay? so. so you can't look at this as a mate. You can make arguments about what happens in the Heisenberg group by saying, well, there are matrices, or oh, here's why things don't commute, or whatever. But you can't say, pick this particular matrix. You just have to say, pick these two elements of the group. In, in Maltsev's case, this works no matter which two non commuting elements you choose. But there's a whole lot of non commuting elements in the Heisenberg group. Right, I mean, that, that canonical choice is, is one out of very many. So, okay. Um, 
So Maltsev's interpretation then says, okay, the domain will be the center of this group. And I already mentioned what that is, these types of matrices here. And of course, if, if you look at the, the group, the, the, if you look at matrix multiplication on the last, last page, as long as you've got the two zeros there, all the, the product of two matrices is just the C plus the C prime. So the field addition practically comes for free. It's just the group multiplication on this domain. Um, and I didn't say here, but multiple does not require any equivalence way, just plain equality. So this is actually a definition of F in H of F with the two parameters. Okay. Um, the second one is the hard one. The field multiplication is defined by this existential formula, which takes a little while to chew through. And even once you, you've digested it, you don't quite understand what it means necessarily. It says, okay, so, so Z0, Z1, and Z2 are three elements of the center. Z0 times one, Z1 equals Z2, if and only if there are group elements X and Y such that, okay, this is the commutator here in the group. The commutator of X with Q is Z0. The commutator of Y with P is Z1. If you do it the other way around, the commutator of X with P or of Y with Q is the identity in the group. And then the commutator of the X with the Y is Z2. Oh, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's a bit of work. Um, it does work out, I and mean, Malta food. That, that this does give you an interpretation of the field in the group. Um, in, again, you need a definition of the field in the group. And yeah, um, you know, everything here is group theoretic language and it's, it's a finitary existential formula. So apart from the two parameters, this is about as nice as you could wish. I mean, from an effectiveness point of view, um, the uh, quantifier free formula wouldn't really be any better. And anyway, you can't do it with quantifier. Not too hard to see. Um, Russell, Russell, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> so this definition will work anytime I, I take any P and Q that don't commute, right? Mm -hmm. So why can't I just get a definition of multiplication which says there exists P, there exists Q, PQ not equal QP, and there exists XY, the rest of this definition? Yeah, okay. So, um, so um, if you just say there exists a P and a Q, then, then this will work for too many D0, Z1s, and Z2s, right? There, um, what's the best way to say this? Um, mom, mom, mom. Just I'll jump forward, do I have? So, so let me try to get, I'm just jumping forward here to try to answer this. Um, here's sort of what's going on here. Um, again, in this case, you know, to look at a specific example, I'm going to use the two matrices P and Q that I mentioned earlier. Um, and in that situation, um, it'll work out that the multiplication says, you know, the, the, this central matrix with C0 times D up here, D is A0, B1, 1, A0, B0 times this other one with a D up here, gives you a product of C0, C1 with the D up here, right? If you choose a different P and Q, the D will be different, right? D comes from the, the, the off first off diagonal coordinates of P and Q. Um, right, okay. And so, and so it, it, would, it would sort of say, okay, you know, just find the right D and, and lots of things, Multiplied by lots of other things will give you lots of things. And, uh, too many. It's too generous on the multiplication in that case. Okay. Um, so, yeah, um, it would be true, of course, let me just point out to everybody, if there were a particular pair of non-commuting parameters and that pair were definable, right? If there were a definition of that specific pair, then you could plug that in and get rid of the parameters from the interpretation, just, just by saying, you know, find the parameters under this definition. Okay. Um, in fact, the, the way the Heisenberg group works, um, every pair of non-commuting elements is in the same is in the same automorphism orbit as every other pair. 
So if I choose P and Q that don't commute, you choose P prime and Q prime that don't commute, there is some automorphism of the Heisenberg group that takes my P and Q to your P prime and Q prime. Okay, so, so no hope of getting a definable pair of parameters, at least this way. Right? It, it, I mean, you can even reverse them, right? There's an automorphism that interchanges P with Q. Um, you, you might have guessed that looking at the, the example earlier, but okay. So, yeah. So if you think about generalizing this mm -hmm. to the computable context, is it a problem that, I mean, if you want to do this similarly, is it a problem that the center is pi one? Like, if you really want to Yeah, okay. I, I, I am going to mention that. Um, it, it Logically, it should have come up before now, um, but I'll show you in a moment when we get there. Um, the center is pi one, but in the Heisenberg group, it actually has a signal on that. Heisenberg group is special, that way. Yeah, but that, you know, good point, right? I, I mean, everything's supposed to be defined by sigma one formulas. Being in the center sounds like a pi one formula. You commute with everything in the group. So that'll have to get fixed. Okay. Um, so, so again, this was Maltzev's. Th this is these are the details of Maltzev's interpretation. Again, the 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 addition in the field is totally natural, but the group multiplication somehow uses the p and the q to pick out this this number D, this field element. And then the group multiplication involves sort of saying, okay, look at an element of the center and think of it as itself only with that C divided by D, right? And D depends on which pair of parameters you chose. Okay, so, so the question was, is there an interpretation without those parameters? This has been open ever since Malta gave that first definition in 1960. Okay. So, okay, so now I get to start naming collaborators here. Rachel Alvier, Wesley Calvert, Valentina Harza, Julia Knight, Andre Morozov, Alex Rosaskova, Rose Weishard, and myself, um, joined later by one more, Grant Goodman, but he didn't come to the first meeting, um, got together and said, okay, we, we, we want to know if there's an interpretation without parameters. Well, there's this theorem about effective interpretations and computable functors. So let's see if we can create a computable functor that takes any Heisenberg group. So the category would be basically all Heisenberg groups, um, all H of Fs, where F is a field or countable field, let's say, and, pr and produces F and moreover takes any isomorphism between copies of H of F and produces an isomorphism between the copies of F. Hmm. Okay, well, so again, if that happens, then we're gonna say that there is at least one of these big nasty interpretations with the infinitary formulas and the arbitrary length tuples, but without parameters. Um, so that would be progress in its way. Yeah, um, right, okay. So um, credit where it's due. It was Andre Morozov who has spent years and years studying fields and automorphisms and things like this. He's the one who came up with the functor. I mean, we were all there, but we, we all think of this as Morozov's lemma. Um, so first of all, it, it's not that hard to imagine a way to take a copy of the group and produce a copy of the field. Um, you're given the atomic diagram of the group. So well, find a pair of parameters that don't commute. You can do that much from the atomic diagram and use them to do Maltz interpretation, right? Again, this sort of suggests why it's important to, to think of this as a functor, to think of interpretations as functors. Um, you know, that half of the functor is totally easy. Okay. But now the problem is, suppose you're given an isomorphism, little g there, between two copies, you know, so you know that H, A0 and H1 are iso both isomorphic, the Heisenberg group of some particular field. You've even sort of built a copy of the field in the first part. Okay. But the isomorphism takes the P0 and the Q0 that you used in H0, the first pair of parameters you found, and maps them to some random pair of non commuting parameters, Q1 prime and Q1 prime in H1. So let's say that Q1 and Q1 are a pair in H1, the pair that you actually used 
when building the group H1, you were hoping, you know, maybe, maybe G of P0 equals P1, G of Q0 equals Q1, then everything would be great. Then you'd have our isomorphism very quickly. Um, but of course, it doesn't have to be that. So, okay, where do you go? And, and Morozov, uh, there are enough details here that I'm not going to drag you through all of them by any means, but Morozov worked out that um, you can get an, a field isomorphism onto the field F1 um, from the field F1 prime. So F1 prime uses the parameters that you're stuck with. F1 is the field that you built using the parameters you wanted to use, P, uh, P1 and Q1. To get that isomorphism, Andre said, ah, oh, okay, so you take any X in F1 prime and you divide it by the identity element in F1 prime, only you do the division in F1. And that works, turns out. I mean, th th as I say, this is Morozov's lemma. This was not obvious to any of the rest of us, but that does work. Mm -hmm. Over, it is functorial, it turns out. This is not totally obvious just looking at that definition. Um, but it, as I say, I don't want to drag down into the details here, but this, this does wind up giving you a functorial map on the isomorphisms. Okay, functorial um, respect. So a functor is required to map the identity morphism to the identity morphism and to respect composition of morphisms, right? And that's important. That's part of the definition. Um, when you say you've got a functor, okay, that's been implicit all the way through. But if we're trying to build a functor, we have to make sure that works. Okay, so Morozov did. It works. Um, and so, and oh, and the last thing I, I had it up here, I didn't bother saying. Moreover, the, this, this whole procedure defining this isomorphism from a given G is existentially definable, at least using the parameters. I mean, so, so you know in this situation, P0 and Q0 are the parameters, you know, the first pair that you found in G0, P1 and Q1 are the first pair you found in H1. And when you're doing this, you're given the isomorphism G. So you can say, oh, what did G map P0 to? Compute that. What did G map P1 to? So you know P1 and Q1 prime as well. And therefore, you know, from that, there is an existential definition of this isomorphism. So you can sort of, you know, um, repair the damage that was caused by choosing the wrong, by G's having chosen the wrong pair of parameters. Um, okay, so um, so Morozov then says, okay, take take the natural field isomorphism that you get using the parameters that G picks out from from F one from F one prime, and composes it with the thing that he did on the previous slide, and putting that the composition of those two then maps F zero onto F one. And it turns out to satisfy the properties required to be a functoriality issues. Okay. So that says there must exist an exist a, a an exist interpretation in that very broad set, a generalized computable infinitary sigma one formulas with arbitrarily long tuples of field elements. Ah, okay. But it's still kind of a mess, right? So Okay, so, so we'd like to do a little bit better than that, even. All right, well, so, um, yeah, so, so if you just go through the proof in the HTM cube theorem and, and say, okay, what does this produce? It, it technically, yes, it does produce arbitrarily long tuples. Um, if you look at it and say, okay, what was it that, that made this, that, 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 that sort of caused the functor to fire, to, to pick out this tuple? Um, well, it's really just true, nothing more. Um, it, it, so, um, I, uh, when we, so when we did that in the, in the functor, the field element was roughly defined by saying, okay, I pick out a particular pair of parameters, and then I find an element of the center of the group. Okay, the, param the parameters are the first two things I find that don't commute, 
And then I look for the first thing I find in the center. Of, well, and, and then the field element is defined by picking the center of the group along with those two parameters. Okay. And so that triple, I mean, you look at what the functor does. It doesn't really pay any attention to anything else. It goes through the entire atomic diagram. And if the first two non-commuting parameters are elements 10 and 20, and the first element of the center is element 5,000, then it gives you a 5,000 tuple because that's what the proof of the theorem said. But it really only looks at the two parameters and the center element. So the idea was, can we shrink this down to maybe just a triple like that? Um, OK. And so it turns out there is a finitary interpretation without parameters by existential formulas. And you, you can really come and understand what's going on here, as long as you accept Morozov's lemma, that, that you, there really were isomorphisms the way he said there were. Um, so the domain of this interpretation is basically what I said a moment ago, an element of the center and any two non-commuting elements of the group. Okay. And this going to turn is where I mentioned about um, being in the center, actually in this group, it actually is a sigma one property. It turns out that to be in the center is equivalent to commuting with both of a pair of non-commuting elements. It's a fact about the Heisenberg group. You know, and again, you know, you look at it as three by three matrices and you can work that out pretty quickly. So, okay, so, whew, okay. Um, and yeah, um, and so, so again, the domain is just a set of triples. The way you want to view it is by saying, okay, look, each particular pair of parameters gives you a copy of the field. So, you know, but for the pair PQ, whatever two parameters, whatever two field elements you have, if PQ or two field elements don't commute, then all of these elements running through all of Zs in the center, all of these things will give you a copy of the field of the Maltzeff's interpretation. So will all of these. Right? So will all of these and so on for every pair of non commuting parameters. And there's only kind of many those pairs, right? We're in a kind of a group here. So, okay. Now, looking at them in these columns, okay, each of those columns is a copy of the field. And we have these isomorphisms among these copies, right? The functor gives you um, isomorphisms from each of these to each other. Um, so, so in particular, the functor gives you an isomorphism from f of pq to f sub p prime q, q prime, that an isomorphism that maps p to p prime and q to q prime. Okay? And similarly for every other pair of columns here. And so uh, I'm just saying, sort of randomly here, let's suppose that the particular functor from this field to this field, we can check maps Z0 PQ, ma maps um, Z0, the field element here, to Z3, the field element here. And of course, maps these parameters to those. And then the next one does this, the next one does something you know, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the idea then is to get a single copy of S, you just want to mod out by the equivalence relation that says, oh, two, thing, two, thing, two of these triples are equivalent if when you line them up in columns and all this, um, the first one, whatever column it's in, gets mapped to the second one, whatever column it's in, by the isomorphism that you get from, from the functor, from the Rosal's time. Okay. And fortunately, that isomorphism is existentially defined. So you can actually go and look for this, okay, and find it, find a witness. Okay, so it, it is clear that modding out by this will give you a copy of the field. And we are allowed to mod out by an equivalence relation. So everything here seems to work. Um, well, hmm. is it actually an equivalence relation? Quick question. Let's just think about that. Um, so the equivalence is again the same that when you apply one of these particular functors to zi, you get zj, right? Okay, um, let, let me go back for a moment to this picture. 
Um, so why, why is that Nicole installation? Well, it's reflective because the functor is functorial and therefore the, the morphism it gives you from f of pq to itself is just the identity. Okay, so, so each d0 pq is in the same class as itself. Furthermore, the functor respects composition. And so whatever isomorphism it gives you from here to here, going back the other way, it gives you the inverse because the composition has to be the identity. And so if z0 is equivalent to z3, then the, well, if this triple is equivalent to this triple, then this one is equivalent to that one. And of course, the third step, if, you're, if the isomorphism takes you from here to here, and then there to there, why is it that, well, this should go there? Well, again, it's because of functoriality. It's because the isomorphisms respect composition this way. So it, it, it's nice the way that all just falls out from the functoriality of the maps there. Okay, um, so yeah, so, so that reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. And then what else? Well, not being equivalent. Basically, these two tuples are inequivalent if this one is equivalent to something else in this column, right? Okay, and that's existential because there exists another ZK prime distinct from ZJ prime that is equivalent, the first thing. Um, and then um, how, how do you add two things in different columns? Well, the first plus the, something from the first column plus something from the next column equals something from this column. Well, okay, just find the things in the first column that are equivalent to this triple and to this triple. So, so I'm gonna pull it back using, again, the definable isomorphisms. Um, and you say, okay, well, if, if when you pull them back, you get an image, you know, a, a ZJPQ and a ZKPQ as sort of the pre-images of that, and the addition works there under the parameters P and Q, then, okay, then, then the additive equation holds here. And multiplication, exactly the same way, you have to write out, you know, you have to write out the definition of addition here and multiplication here, which I don't want to do, but they're, they're all just defined that way. And once again, their negations are defined just like that. You know, Z on equals ZJ does not equal ZK if and only if it equals something else. So that's existential. Okay. And so, so there is a finite interpretation using only triples, you know, a totally traditional interpretation using only triples and no parameters. And it's effective, so existential formulas. So, so basically, it, this is good. You know, this, this is a good result. Um, you can take that process and generalize it. And you can generalize it in a lot of different ways, and I'm not going to write them all down here. But if you have um, interpretations with parameters and you want to turn them into parameter free interpretations, again, you have to write down exactly what was necessary for this process. Um, and in some cases, you say, well, if, if you start with planetary formulas, you can finish with planetary formulas. If you start with, you know, Sigma six formulas, you can finish with sigma six formula. And there's all kinds of permutations, this sort of stuff. Um, basically, they all pair up. Um, and again, it, it doesn't seem appropriate to, to go into all the details right here. Um, but the main thing that you need is to exist one of these systems of uniformly definable. Um, I said automorphisms there, and I probably should have said isomorphisms. Um, between the different copies. Right. So that, that, that lemma of Morozov really was the key to all of this. Okay. Um, there is another question you could ask, which is, well, what Maltzev gave was a definition with parameters, but definition, you know, no, no equivalence relation necessary, just plain equality. Um, so ours was not. Right, I mean, we had this equivalence relation. Okay, well, so could we get rid of the equivalence relation? And the answer to that is no, turns out. At least not as long as you stick to traditional finitary interpretations. Um, and this, um, hmm. 
if you just sit down with this and say, okay, how could I try to, you know, it, it, what, how could I prove that there's no way to pull a copy of F out of H of F without parameters in the traditional way? I mean, nothing jumps out at you. I mean, Morozov had thought about this a good deal, but it turns out there's a totally elementary proof here. Here it is. So suppose that there were a finitary definition. Okay. Now, another fact about the Heisenberg group, and I'll run through this quickly, um, the only element of a Heisenberg group that's fixed by all automorphisms of that group is the identity. Obviously, the identity is fixed. But um, anything else? Well, first of all, if you take a different element, if you take an element of the Heisenberg group that's fixed by all automorphisms, it's got to be in the center. Because you can, I mean, uh, uh, conjugation um, is always an automorphism, an inner automorphism. And if there's anything you don't commute with, then conjugating u by that element is going to move you. Okay. So the only candidates are elements in the center. That was elements with, you know, ones on the diagonal, zero, c, zero above it. Okay. And then, like, I, I still have these here. Um, the automorphism that interchanges the two canonical non-commuting elements, um, you work out what it is, and if you apply it to an element of the center, zero, C, zero, it maps that to, same thing, zero, negative C, zero. Turns out, you know, I, I mean, go back and look at the, the definition of multiplication, that will just fall out for you. Um, so, uh, so if, if you're in the center and you're fixed by that automorphism, You've got to be the identity. Okay. So the only element, as it says, only element of H fixed by all automorphisms of H is the identity. And so if you were to define H of F in, uh, I'm sorry, if you were to define F, the field, in H or in HN, you know, using N tuples, let's say, um, then the only N tuple fixed by all automorphisms of H is the identity and is the tuple of the identity n times. But now in the field, there are two different elements that are fixed by all automorphisms. Zero and one. It's a field. Okay. One of them maybe is represented in this interpretation by this identity tuple, but the other isn't. They can't both be. And so for for whatever non-identity tuple represents the other one of these two, there's some automorphism of H that moves it, and that gives you an automorphism of the field. Now, if this were an interpretation, the automorphism of H could take this n-tuple and move it to a different n-tuple that was still equivalent, right? If, if it were an interpretation, then distinct n tuples could be equivalent. That's allowed. Okay. And so, yes, you can have an interpretation that does this. But in a definition, that doesn't happen. So, so since we're supposing that we have a definition, um, the automorphs, whatever the, the non-identity tuple is, representing 0 and 1, it would get moved by an automorphism. And that means there'd be an automorphism of the field that moves one of the two field identity elements, and that's absolutely impossible. You might also stop and ask, how does it change if there are parameters? The answer is, well, if, if I mean, in Malta's original interpretation was a definition with those two parameters, what happens there is the automorphism of H is allowed to move the parameters. And if it does that, then okay, then it's fair to move the, the like the, the it's A here that represents one of the field identity elements. So, so, so you see where everything plays into that, right? But, um, but yeah, the, there and there's no finitary definition, and incidentally, not even using sigma two, sigma n, any finitary formulas. There's no finitary definition of H of F in F without parameters. Um, so if, if you'll permit me to moralize for a second, I think the moral of this is it really is smart to think of interpretations as giving you functors, 
right? If you just think of the interpretation as a way to see a copy of A inside a copy of B, I don't know any good way to prove this. But when you say, oh yeah, there, there are, you know, interpretations also map isomorphisms to isomorphisms, automorphisms to automorphisms. With that, you get this really elementary proof. Okay. So, okay, so, so a moral, such as it is. Um, a good talk should also have questions instead of a moral. So let me finish up with a couple of those. Um, one of them, um, so I haven't used this term yet until now, but is it possible for the field and its Heisenberg group to be bi-interpretable? Now, first reaction to that, well, yeah, you just gave an interpretation of each one and the other, right? Okay, yeah, we did. Um, bi-interpretable means something more than just that. And I, I didn't write down all the details on the slide here, so I'm hoping that this will show up somehow using our OWL. Um, the idea is, um, suppose you have interpretations both ways, F and H of F, H and F, or you know, A and B and B and A. Let me just use A and B to keep it simple. Um, if you have interpretations both ways, then you have, well, inside B, you have a copy of A, let's just suppose N tuples in this case. Um, so this is a copy of A, and then B itself can be seen as sitting inside A as a bunch of M tuples. Um, so A is isomorphic to B, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, th this is totally wrong. Of course, A is not isomorphic to the end, you know, it's, the, it's the definable set, modular the relation, blah, 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 blah. But okay, A, so, so maybe the better way to say here is that A, quote unquote, sits inside B to the end, and then B, sits inside A to the M, and putting these two together, you sort of see A living as a collection of MN tuples inside itself, right? And also the other way around, you could see B as a collection of NM tuples sitting inside itself, okay? For a bi-interpretation, okay, so, so there's an isomorph, well, true. There's a map here that sends each element of A to the MN tuple representing it here. So, so an isomorphism, so to speak, um, but a map from A to this copy of A inside B inside A. And likewise, an isomorphism from B to its copy hiding inside it. And to be a bi-interpretation, um, both of those maps have to be definable. So that's the definition. You know. Um, so it's not good enough just to say there's an interpretation both ways. Um, sort of the result of doing the one and then the other has to be definable in, in the original structure. Doesn't always happen that way, okay? And in particular, we know examples here where it does not happen, um, mainly because one consequence of bi-interpretability is that the automorphism groups of the two structures have to be isomorphic, okay? Um, and for fields, as far as we can tell, that doesn't happen. I mean, for fields and their Heisenberg groups, that doesn't happen. Um, so example with the rationals, um, the rationals are a rigid field, but their Heisenberg group, I mean, the Heisenberg groups are all very far from rigid. You've seen they have all these automorphisms and then parameters all over the place. So, so there's certainly no bi-interpretability between Q and H of Q. <laughs> um, another point here, um, anytime you have an automorphism of F, it gives you an automorphism of the Heisenberg group just by applying that automorphism to those three elements in, in you know, view the Heisenberg group as upper triangular matrices and map the, the ABC matrix to the H of A, H of B, H of C matrix. Okay, so that is an embedding one to one. So aught of F always sits inside aught of H of F. Um, furthermore, that definitely does not give you the, the automorphism that interchanges the zero and the one here. You know, it can't possibly map one to zero and zero to one. So um, so aught of H of F has a lot more automorphisms than just 
the ones that it inherits from S this way, it's impossible for the two automorphism groups to be isomorphic. It means if they're isomorphic, then R of F is isomorphic to a proper subgroup of itself, so it has a proper self-embedding. We don't know any good examples of this, but that doesn't mean they're out there. So open question, you know, could you ever have by interpretability between these? Um, don't know. Okay. Um, and one other question, um, which isn't really specifically about the, the Heisenberg group, but just about this whole notion of interpretations and functors. Um, so what we know now with these HDM squared and HDM cubed theorems is that most functor, and Borel functors, which covers an awful lot of them, um, on categories of structures like ISO of A and ISO of B, correspond to interpretations as long as you use this broad notion of the generalized computable infinitary formulas. Um, so if you restrict yourself to the traditional interpretations, within the class of all those functors, what do the traditional interpretations correspond to? Is there any nice, I don't know what nice would be in this context, but you know, is there any natural class of functors that correspond to traditional interpretations? I mean, in a certain sense, this is what we were wondering at one point during this whole project. You know, we said, oh, okay, great. So there is a, you know, a, a, an infinitary interpretation. Is, is that the best we can do or can we get it down to a finitary one? And the answer in the case of the Heisenberg situation was it turned out to be that you could break it down to just a finite hearing interpretation. Um, so could you tell from the functor whether that's possible or not? You know, is there any sort of characterizing the functors that correspond to traditional interpretations versus those that don't? I have not the faintest idea how to go about that. Um, in a way, I feel like I'm it would overstate it to say challenging the validity of finitary formulas, but um, it does happen in computable structure theory. You wind up talking about computable infinitary formulas a lot more than most model theorists ever do. And so we somehow regard them as very legitimate and in other quarters, they're a little questionable. You know, I mean, you need to stick with finitary formulas if you want to have things like compactness and stuff. Okay, so that's a good reason, um, but if the finitary formulas really are, a, you know, as wonderful natural a class as, as they're thought to be, you'd sort of hope that they would correspond to a natural class of functors here. Yeah. At least if they do, that would be evidence that they are wonderful and terrific and great. Um, if they don't, then, then they're just sort of floating around being finitary. So, okay. So, um, you know, when can we do what we did in this talk? When, when can we look at a functor, ideally, and say, is it possible to turn this into um, a traditional interpretation, not just an infinite interpretation? Okay, so with that, I'm going to bring things to a close. Um, I'll look for questions from everybody here. Thanks very much. Um. What is special about Heisenberg groups, like, in general, mm -hmm. other than this, like, where did they come from? Um, they came from Heisenberg. <laughs> yeah. And that's um, who? <laughs> so, that's who they come from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where was he? Um, okay, they came from Germany. Yeah. Um, <laughs> quite sure there are answers to that, and I don't know them all yet. Is anybody? Yeah. Anybody? <laughs> I definitely remember encountering them in physics classes about yeah. what they were doing. The customer wound up getting a Nobel Prize at one point for work that involved um sort of I forget if he was looking at a field or something, but he he, he finally realized oh the elements here don't have to commute and you can think of them as matrices. 
I don't know if that was actually the Heisenberg group that he came up with at that point. Does anybody remember this? I, mean, I, I think it comes up in quantum mechanics. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But that's why I was. But I don't. I don't. I can't be any more specific than that. Sir, I couldn't have been that specific precisely. Um, yeah. So okay. So so I don't have a, a good answer, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, you said like you gave that formula the concept found um, mm -hmm. sigma one with two parameters, right. and you proved that you can't do that without parameters. Can you do quantifier free, but maybe with parameters, or is that unknown? Um, I don't think we chased it down, but I, I, it seems safe to say that you can't do it quantifier free. I, I mean, just um, one, I, one could go and find counter examples readily enough. I, I haven't thought about it too much, but I mean, I, um, so, somehow, I, I mean, you know, the standard theorem in, in computability that is said is computable if and only if both it and its complement are computably enumerable. And so often that, that's how you wind up thinking of computable, you know, it, 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 so in computable structure theory, I mean, a quantifier free definition would be nice, but computables much more often means both it and its complement are definable by existential formulas, right? So, so, which is exactly what I just said, you know, it and its complement are both CE. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 we haven't chased it down, but I, I'm, I'm sure the answer is no, you can't do it with, without quantifiers. And I just uh, had this thought, I mean, it's kind of obvious in a way, I guess, but um, so we have, you have this theorem of Balsev where basically the big obstacle was to pick two elements that have a nice property because you can definitely choose them, right? And by passing to computable models, once you have them represented in a way, you can just, you have a well-ordering of the elements yeah. and that's how you can just pick the yeah. friend. Mm -hmm. Uh, which in a way kind of almost seems like cheating. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, I guess, well, I, I guess I'm just wondering if there is a way to make sense of that. If you have like, if it doesn't matter which elements you pick, like no matter which two you pick, you always get something that defines isomorphic structure. Right? Like, um, it, it's almost, it, it almost feels like it would be just nice to say, okay, let's just assume a well ordering of the structure that we that yeah. we're working with. I mean, there, like, is there, a way to... there is also the, the sense in computable structure theory that you say, oh, finitely many parameters, I can just take those for free. You know, it's finitely much information. So um, what I'd sort of say here is th this, you can do this, but when you start thinking about isomorphisms at the same time, that's when it falls apart, right? Because if you just pick two parameters satisfying you know, non commuting whatever in your structure and I pick two in mine, but then an isomorphism from yours to mine doesn't happen to match, to map your parameters to my parameters, then the question is, okay, how, how do we deal with this? You know, can, can we do what Morozo did and, and you know, say, okay, that isomorphism, then here's the twist that you give it to, to get something that actually comes to mind. Um, and that's, in a, in a way that, that says, again, that morphisms are important, right? And if you're trying to do it right and get the isomorphisms right, then just picking out two parameters is good enough. Thank you again. Thank you.